So I have this theory, and it is very much just a theory. But like many theories, there is an indication towards something that comes from other facts. And I have two particular studies that pointed me in this direction. Both studies are about different things by different people, but they indicate a certain muscle, the rectus capitis posterior minor, as an indicator of either chronic headaches when they look at the hypertrophy of the muscle, that's excess growth and thickening, or in this other study, the recovery rate after a mild traumatic brain injury. In this case, they're using it as a predictor for how well the patient will do after this injury. And this is really neat, the fact that we can look at a cross-section of this muscle and say based on its relative size uh, compared to a control group, based on its relative size, we can predict how well a person will do, whether that's a headache or it is a traumatic brain injury, a mild one. And there is a reasoning for this. And this is as well newer research. And it's saying that where previously we thought the rectus capitis posterior minor was attached from the occipital bone skull to the C1 vertebrae, it's actually now been shown that it's really more attached to the dura mater and the occipital bone. Look at the angle of pull here, and that should start to tell you about something. So the dura mater, this thing wrapping around here, is a connective tissue that goes around both the brain and the spinal cord. And it goes all the way down, of course. I just didn't happen to draw it in. But it protects the brain and spinal cord. And it as well feeds right in. It goes to the arachnoid and the pia mater. And these encase the brain and spinal cord and help it to sustain its position. But at the same time, they carry an important fluid through it. This here, all this stuff going all the way down again, is what we call the cerebrospinous fluid, or CSF for short. The CSF has an important function. It carries nutrients to the brain, and spinal cord, as well it takes away waste products from the brain and spinal cord. So just like any cell, they produce waste products and they have to be removed so that we can make space for new stuff to come in or so we can prevent toxicity from building up. At the same time, this fluid actually allows the brain to float slightly so that it cushions against excess pressurizations or hard jarring motions as best as it can anyways. So it's very important that this fluid actually circulates at all times. There's a certain amount being produced inside and it's exiting out the brain. So it's being produced somewhere in around here and then it exits out and it flows all the way down the brain, all the way around the brain. And then it flows down towards the spinal cord. It will actually go through the skull down into the spinal cord. Now that whole system is actually reversed too because that fluid that goes into the spinal cord must also come out and flow back up towards the brain, eventually leading back to what we call the dural venous sinuses, which is the, really the veins of the brain. There we go. And it will go into the arachnoid villi, which are openings to get that waste product and the used up CSF basically out and it'll filter it back into that venous system and then out through the internal jugular. It's great. It's fun. It's really, really good. So we want that CSF to be in constant flow around the brain and spinal cord. That's a very important thing. That's, it's well understood that it serves an important function. Now, the reason why the rectus capitis posterior mitre could be implicated in either chronic headache or recovery from mild traumatic brain injury is because that small muscle seems unimportant, but that small muscle does change the shape of the dura mater. So let's say, for instance, we were in an extended position. We'll just start with that real simple. We've put our head backwards. So the head comes backwards like that. Understand that as you go into this extended position, you also drive the bottom end slightly forward by comparison. If you've ever seen the occipital condyles, you basically have it's, it's relatively two synovial joint system, 
And what you'll have is when it's in a back position, when it's in a, in a flex position, the reverse of what we have here, it'll be a little bit back. It's not just a perfect pivot, but it'll slide a little bit back. And as you go into an extended position, they'll be driven forward just slightly. So the whole position of the skull actually slides forward a little bit, but it's enough to change the relationships of the interacting structures. Two of those structures is the frame and magnum. That'll be the blue one here. And then the C1 vertebrae, that'll be our black one. So just like we had before, I'm exaggerating here, but if we were in more of a flex position, we drive the opening back. Just think for a second, we've got, you know, the brain above this point, the brain's all above here, and then the spinal cord actually exits through this opening. Consider what's happening there. By comparison, again, that first one was a big exaggeration. By comparison, as we go forward into a extended position of the skull on the spine, we change the shape and the opening between the C1 vertebrae, that first cervical vertebrae, and the frame and magnum, the opening in the skull for the spinal cord to pass through. The dura mater is, dura mater is of course attached to all of this. It is between those two bones, and this is a relatively strong connection point. And so it's really, it's really C1, C2, by the way, but don't worry about that. C1, C2, and the occiput, but don't worry about that. As we change the relationship as it's driven forward, it makes sense that the dura mater would actually go forward along with it. So it would be pushed along with it. Considering the size of this space, I'm just going to take this away just to clear that up a little bit. Considering that we are pushing forward into this space, we would likely have a little bit less of it in the back here. And because it's very important that that CSF flows down through here, it could be that we're preventing the optimal flow of that. This is not a fatal thing. It's not something that's going to cause massive damage right away, but it makes your skull CSF flow suboptimal. It's not working as well as it could be. So based on the position of the rectus capitis posterior minor, it, through its orientation, can contract, pulling back on that dura, because it is attached to it, and the skull is a relative fixed point. Even though it's moved into that extended position, as we have it here, even though it's moved in that extended position, it's a good anchor to pull on. So the dura mater can come forward, or relatively posterior in this case, but it can come along with that muscle, be pulled by that muscle, and this will allow that rectus capitis posterior major to pull in this orientation, to pull it away from that C1, C2 vertebrae, and instead of pushing into the area, it actually gets pulled away. More likely it wouldn't be outpouched, it would be more of just in a neutral position. And what this could do is keep this area patent, keep this area behind the brain stem going into the spinal cord, it could keep it open just well enough to allow proper CSF flow in really any position of the head. You know, we've given uh, extended position here, but side bending and rotation, of course, are relevant too, because there's lots of different positions. This is just an easy to understand example. So consider for a second, consider if this didn't happen, if that space was not maintained, if the rectus capitis posterior minor couldn't pull that bit of dura mater off and away from the brainstem spinal cord as it goes through the frame and magnum into the C1, C2 area. Consider what would happen if the flow of CSF is not proper, if it can't properly go from spinal cord to brain, from brain to spinal cord, we wouldn't have as much CSF clearance. We wouldn't have as much flow around the brain, and we probably have a little bit, just a little bit, nothing major, but a little bit of pressure buildup a little bit of waste accumulation, and maybe a little bit of impeded supply to either the brain or the spinal cord. And so because it's not functioning as well as it could be, it might be the reason why we see the rectus capitis posterior minor when it's thickened, when it's not working right. Basically, it's not as capable of contracting as an indicator for chronic headache or something that would slow or impede the recovery of the brain after a mild traumatic brain injury.
this is the theory that I'm proposing anyways as well because we work in the manual therapy world it could be also a second theory in fact it could be also that by making that rectus capitis muscle better more functional more robust and more able to contract less fibrosed or hypertrophied it could be that by improving that muscle we also can improve the health and wellness of the brain and spinal cord anyways just a theory hope it made sense